The next few moments are divided, devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us and give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into the seven compartments of our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I happened to come across a story today about a young preacher. There was a time when I was a young preacher. Still am. And as part of that, I can say there are people in their 40s listening to me, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, some of whom I've talked to, some, some of whom I will never know until uh, we all meet in heaven one glorious day. But... For, the, for those who are listening to me and they know that I'm 34 years old, I have a great respect for that. I remember the first time I went into a doctor and he was younger than me, I had an odd feeling. I said, what, he's a doctor? And he was, and he was a good doctor. And so, of course, I kept him as my doctor. But the older you get, there's a kind of arrogance that may slip in that says, I'm older, so I know more. It's not necessarily true. Definitely wasn't true in the case of Saul of Tarsus, who was a super genius. And there are people in their early 20s. There are people in their teens. There are people, have you ever seen smarter than a fifth grader? There are fifth graders smarter than me in terms of how people measure smartness. So I understand. And that's why the Apostle Paul said and and told Timothy, do not let them despise you because of your youth, and not spiritual youth, physical youth. But it really got to Peter. And it is something, but it's almost a normal thing. But really it just shows negative volition, and it shows arrogance, because it is the message, not the man. Not at all. Well, here we have a young preacher just starting out. And they gave him a duty to go preach at a funeral. And the uh, local funeral director said, Look, uh, we need you to go hold a graveside committal service. And it's going to be at one of these uh, local small cemeteries. And there will be no family. And there will be no friends. Uh, the, the man was died a recluse. So the preacher started early but quickly and he headed off even though he knew that he would probably be the only one there standing at the grave and he would give the service. And that reminds me of when I first started preaching. I had to drive quite a ways to go to where my congregation was at the time. And I got there one day and nobody showed up, not a soul except me. And uh, I had just started, so I said, well, I need to practice anyway. I drove this far. I might as well just start preaching. And uh, it was a rather, you know, it was a large room for the, the size and the amount of people we would ever have in there on a, a given day. And I had all of the accoutrements of uh, what a preacher would have with the board and the, the lighting and so and whatnot and where I could write down a Greek word and they could see it on the board. And so I started preaching and going to town and there wasn't a soul listening to me. And this story kind of, kind of reminds me of that. But the funny part was, while I was preaching, a woman came in late and she thought she was going to be chewed out for being late. And then she saw I was the only one there. And there was a look of, well, she didn't laugh. I would have laughed. 
<laughs> but she didn't laugh. She sat down and just kind of looked around wondering, well, what in the world? And then afterwards she said, oh, I was late. I'm sorry for being late. And I said, I'm the only one here preaching. I, I thought you would think I was crazy when you walked in and then turn around and walk out. But she stayed and listened. And where two or more gathered together, the Lord's there with them. And so there was a purpose for me to be preaching there that day, even though one person walked in. Now that's the motivation a pastor should have. The motivation to teach the Word of God because he loves his sheep. And uh, sheep go astray quite often. And then sometimes sheep come back. And sometimes sheep need a good whipping. But that comes from the Word of God. Well, along with this story... The, the preacher started quickly and early. It was uh, one of his first sermons, and he was actually excited about it. So he drove off to the graveside where this man was buried who knew no one, the recluse. But he got lost, and he made several wrong turns. Apparently, he was listening to the GPS system my father has in the Honda. He made several wrong turns. And he was out in the middle of nowhere. But he did find a cemetery. He said, oh, this must be it. So he arrived about a half hour late, but it didn't matter. Nobody was going to be there anyway. He arrived there and he, he saw that uh, there were some workmen nearby eating lunch. And there was an open grave where uh, the, there was a hole. So he figured this must be it. The workmen are eating lunch. They've just finished digging the hole. I'm a half hour late. They're waiting uh, for me to preach before they lower the body into the ground forever. So the pastor went to the open grave, but when he got there, he found the vault lid already in place. But uh, that didn't stop him. He took out his book and his notes, and he began to read the service to no one just standing over the grave because that's what he was told to do by the funeral director. And as he was returning to his car after his 20-minute sermon, he overheard one of the workmen say, Do you think we should tell him that that's a septic tank? Well, there's a principle to that. Oftentimes when I'm up here preaching, I feel like I'm preaching to a septic tank. Now, that's an insult to you and I'm joking. But still... That is just a little frivolity. And if you're offended by that, go somewhere else because you're really going to be offended when I get to the Word of God. So turn in your Bibles to Acts 2.22. Yes, Acts 2.22. We've been there a while. And yes, I want you to turn there again. And yes, I want to hear the pages turn. And yes, I want to see people's Bibles in their hands. And yes, I want to see people taking notes. This is a Bible class. Well, you don't have to prove it to me. Well, where's your Bible? Ah, caught you. You even have textbooks and silly classes in college about environmental science, environmental gobbledygook. Well, this is the Word of God. Get it out. Acts 2.22 you don't know where it is, find it. Look it up in the concordance. Acts 2.22 And I have this new system now by whereby I don't have to sit in that squeaky chair and I can actually speak straight to the audience and... Uh, this new microphone that I attach to myself, hopefully it will make the quality much better uh, for you to listen. For he who has an ear, let him hear good quality microphone sound. I added that part. All right, Acts 2.22. Now, this is Peter laying it on the line. First time Peter's ever laid it on the line. And I did tell you I would go down and get the uh, Peter's uh, personality profile but uh, there's been so much moving around from state to state, from South Carolina, well, from Anderson, well, from Spartanburg to Anderson, to Spartanburg, to, and that's all in South Carolina, to, uh, well, I've moved, I, I moved to Texas, 
I lived in Spartanburg, moved to Texas, moved to Spartanburg, moved to Anderson, moved back to Spartanburg, moved to Indiana, moved to Ohio. My parents moved from South Carolina to New Jersey to Ohio, and then beforehand, lots of other places. I was born in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, where, where else did I live? Columbia, South Carolina. Who knows? Hard to say. But uh, I've been all over the place. But the thing is, <clears throat> we all do have a geographical area, and I am where I am now because this is where God wants me to be. And right now, uh, Peter is where God wants him to be, and he's about to chew out some very negative people called Pharisees. They are the worst to convert. But Peter is a, an apostle to the Jew. The, the apostle Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles. And the Jews are negative. In Anderson, South Carolina, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ were negative. Now, in Acts 2.22... Peter is talking to unbelievers, and we will understand that, and I want you to make note of it, but we must focus on who we are as believers and how we too can get involved in arrogance that will lead to scar tissue of the soul and that will lead to a deafness. You'll get to the point to where you won't be able to hear even if you want to hear. And if you go to the... Facebook page that I have for evangelism called How in the Hell Do I Get to Heaven? That should be easy to remember, right? How in the hell do I get to heaven? You'll see uh, the newest one up there is a picture of an actor crying. And then it talks about how Esau tried to weep his way into heaven, but he would not receive the blessing. Because you don't cry your way into heaven. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit takes that faith and makes it effective, for it is the power of God unto salvation, not the power of your physiological tear. God is not impressed with tears. God is impressed with tears of blood that our Lord Jesus Christ had oozing out of the pores of his skin as each and every sin was imputed to him and judged. Now nobody saw it. Darkness fell over the land. But blood came out of the pores of his skin. It was so painful. So God is not impressed with your tears. And if you go commit a sin and you feel sorry for it and have the guilt complex, you could cry yourself to sleep every night for a month and God is not impressed. And not only is he not impressed, he, uh, you are not forgiven of those sins you've committed because you have not rebounded. We have far too many Christians who do not understand God. They have humanized God. And the Pharisees have humanized God as what we would call legalist. A Christian who relies on his own works is called a legalist. A an unbeliever who relies on his own works is called religious. And so we have Peter in Acts 2.22 filled with the Spirit. And you're going to see a boldness from him that if you've ever read the Gospels and even paid any close attention to Peter, I understand if you don't have the gift of pastor teacher, you could have read it and not known a clue of what was going on, fine. But I can tell you, Peter was a knucklehead. Our Lord called him a knucklehead. Our Lord gave him the chance to even have the endowment of the Spirit, and he, he didn't ask for it. Our Lord asked Peter, can you drink from the cup I'm about to drink of? He said, oh yeah, yeah, sure. And you know what our Lord was talking about? He was saying, Peter, can you die on the cross for the sins of the entire world? And Peter said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Now, doesn't that make Peter a little bit dumb? Well, yes, quite a lot. And blasphemous, but he had no clue. He was way out in the Thule's. Why? No power of the Spirit, and we have it. We have the very power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead available to us. And someone one at was someone once asked, underthinking. Some people think they overthink. There are people who overthink. They're called smart. 
Then there are people who underthink. They're just stupid. And uh, the person said, what does that mean? What do you mean? I have the, the Holy Spirit that is in me. I have the power of resurrection. I can resurrect myself. And you miss the whole point. No. God the Holy Spirit is the power. God the Holy Spirit resurrected the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't resurrect Himself. And you don't resurrect yourself. It's the whole, it's a principle turned upside down because, and this person couldn't understand it because of legalism. It had to do with who and what they were. Oh, I can raise myself from the dead? Who said anything about you? It's mentioning God, the Holy Spirit, and the power of the Spirit. It is the power of God unto salvation, and it's no different when it comes to the spiritual life. It is the power of God unto your spiritual life, and you can't walk around with your nose stuck up in the air thinking you've done something great when God, the Holy Spirit, has done it all along. All you did was respond with volition. And you said yes. You had ears and you decided to listen. And that's a benefit to you. And you are rewarded as part of that benefit in heaven. But there are so many foolish people going toward legalism who used to know better, but now are listening to so much crud whose ears are tickling that they hop here and there and everywhere, and they're not going to get it. In fact, they did have it, but they've lost their first love. And if you're listening to me once again, you see the funny thing is, I read a joke on uh, Facebook and it talked about Facebook being the only place where your enemies read what you write the most and your friends read what you write the least, etc. So those I've stepped on their toes, they come back to listen and they're listening right now and I haven't changed my opinion. If you're still listening to three to five to ten different pastors, you have itching ears and you have failed in your spiritual life. And I gave you the verse where it said, and you listened to a pastor and I didn't write it. I had a friend come over this weekend and we the, the subject turned to the Bible because the friend is a Christian. And, of course, if someone's offering their opinion, I said, well, this is an opportunity Already being a Christian, I knew I didn't have to witness. Even though I made it clear, you believe in Christ, you're saved. And uh, that was an easy one to grasp. So my friend believed that. But then the subject went off toward, uh, I don't know, uh, I guess she had met some man or something and wanted to uh, have some advice on it and what to do in marriage and how hard relationships are, etc. And they are difficult. Uh, Paul said they would be. He said there's a lot of trouble in the flesh. So the Bible says it's hard, it's hard. Paul says it's difficult, it's difficult. And so I said, well, I'll tell you how to handle a man. She said, how do you do it? I said, if I tell you, you will get angry with me. And then I said, she said, no, tell me. I said, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you the Bible. And I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I want you to read it. And I want you to know I didn't write it. And I don't want you to get angry with me. She read 1 Peter chapter 3 and she got angry with me. <laughs> you see how people are. But uh, not anger in a sense of antagonism, but just to anger in a sense of but my goodness it, the, have, have you seen some of these men out there how could you ever exactly don't marry them don't be around them I've seen some of these men out there who aren't men at all I live in a totally different generation than my parents my parents I don't think would have any clue about what's going on among my generation which is part of the fourth generation curse I don't think they have any clue how terrible it is how it is so amoral, not just immoral, amoral. They don't care. They're like the, the people, they say, people have gone their own way. And that's what they do. They go their own way. And they're believers, a lot of them, even here up north, especially down south. 
and uh, up north there are believers and there's Catholics who aren't believers but uh, and there's a mixture but either way we in the United States have the largest percentage of Christians and yet they have no concept of what virtue is I hear a lot of people talking about integrity and that's important there's an integrity envelope but really it's a virtue envelope a virtue love envelope integrity an unbeliever can have integrity and guess what you are not to be unequally yoked which means you cannot marry an unbeliever and but you can marry a believer but I'll tell you something else if you're positive toward the word of God and you marry a believer who is negative toward the word of God I can tell you you have just signed up for misery and you say how do you know did you experience something like that you better believe the hell I have and it's misery don't do it I'm giving you a warning I've been through it do not marry the wrong person because you think that uh you get desperate and you think no one else will come along. That's one reason. Wait on the Lord. Be patient. And besides, it's not so bad being single. And you'll realize that if you ever go through something. You'll realize single is freedom. And the big problem with marriage is the two people in marriage don't give, give each other enough space to have freedom. Freedom. You're still individuals. You're still people who make your own decisions. You have to have freedom. And that's something we're losing in this country. Because everyone has their nose stuck in everyone's business. Every time I see a so-called smart car, I think of a self-righteous, religious, liberal nut, unbeliever. I went into work the other day and I was... A bit late because uh, there was a car accident on Highway 70. I drive all highway and it still takes me about 30 minutes to get to work. And I got stuck on 70 behind this uh, semi who had uh, ran into a car. Well, my boss wasn't there that day, so I just wrote a letter. I said, look, you'll see that I was here about uh, 10 minutes late. Uh, I was behind a car accident. If you want a picture, it's on my cell phone. And uh, apparently the smart car was dumb. And then he came. And then he came. He he said, "Well, thanks for letting me know." And he called me over and he said, "Did it really, did it really hit a smart car?" And I said, "No, I don't think so. But it sure did look like one after it got hit." Well, we live in crazy times, and all that liberalism and all that junk of the government telling you what to do and what kind of light bulb to have. What is that? An invasion of privacy. And you know who's responsible for it? Believers! Not unbelievers. You know why? Believers stick their nose into everyone else's business. They're like little communist cells. Do you know what so-and-so did? You know where I saw so-and-so's car? Whether true or not. I saw so-and-so's car at the go-go bar, whatever that is. I really don't know. And don't say, I think you know what that is. No, I don't know. I've never been to a go-go bar. I've been to Hooters. I know what that is. It's a lot of Hooters. And uh, so what? I've been to Cancun where they don't even wear anything on top. They wear things on bottom. Who cares? I care. It's pretty. But anyway... Acts 2, 20, and there's nothing wrong with uh, those type of uh, things. People get so uptight and they say, you are, you're talking crazy. That's not how a pastor talks. And if you're that way and if you're so uptight and you don't know how to take a joke, then you don't belong here. As Herman Cain said, Americans need to learn how to take a joke. And as I will say, Christians need to learn how to lighten up. Lighten up. Give people space and freedom. And you will find out that the more freedom and space you give people and the more you just live your life as unto the Lord and, and you uh, live and let live, you'll find out you'll have, people will recognize it and you will have impact on people's lives that you never even knew you did because you, you stand out like a sore thumb. 
You're not running around gossiping with all the little groups about each and everything. And this is work, of course. It especially happens at work. It's just a part of life at work. Running around this and that and the other. Let me tell you about this. Well, let me tell you about what so-and-so did. And why did so-and-so come in late? And sometimes there'll be that the hypocrisy, that concern. And they'll be sitting at their desk. And they'll look over. The other desk is empty. And they'll be thinking, where's so-and-so? So-and-so's late. And then a little smile crosses their face. They're going to get in trouble. But then when they arrive, oh, I was so worried about you. No, you weren't. Stop being a hypocrite. You, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? But all that can change when you live your spiritual life, when you're filled with God, the Holy Spirit. And this is where we're going in Acts 22. Uh, 2.22, where Peter finally gets the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. He's a different man. Totally. Because God, the Holy Spirit, caused him to remember many of the messages that our Lord had given him over three years. And it just brought it right to his memory so fast. He knew what to say without having one note. God, the Holy Spirit, gave it to him. Sometimes I don't even go off my notes and you say, yeah, I've heard you. <laughs> I, okay. See, I, I have some self-deprecating humor. But here he is, Peter. Acts 2.22. Yes, I'm going over it again. It's important because some people think that a pastor has to be a certain way. He has to be nice to the little unbelievers especially the ones who are the most antagonistic, be nice to them to bring them around. Even agree with them or something. And when a pastor who knows better gets under pressure, and especially if they get interviewed on TV, I'll tell you, there's a pastor, a very famous pastor down in Houston. I'm not talking about the colonel who's with the Lord, of course. But another guy who's even more famous... And he has this very large church with a lot of human viewpoint. A lot of positive uh, motivational speaking. Oh, I could give you some motivational speaking. Shoot, I could make a lot of money giving motivational speaking. That's not hard. To motivate someone in terms of motivating them in their job or whatever they're doing. And I've heard some motivational speakers at where I work that are very, very good at it. And they will actually motivate people to go sit at their desk and do their job right for about three hours. But it did help for three hours. And then, But there might be a few who really catch on and say, you know what, I can go somewhere here if I do, just like that woman said. And guess what? In a lot of cases, you can. But uh, when it comes to motivational speaking and human viewpoint, that's not what my job is. My job is to teach what God the Holy Spirit is well, God, the Holy Spirit, is the one in control. And also, plus Operation Z, me knowing the Word of God. And uh, just because I'm 34 does not know, you know more verses than me because you're 70. You have no idea. I have... <laughs> I've been over the Bible so many times. When I worked uh, at this one machine shop, and I'm, or am I bragging on myself? Yeah, I'll brag about the Word of God, sure, just like Paul did. And I would listen to, for, I would listen to the Colonel for a while, and then I say, you know what? I hear the doctrines and I get it. I want to have some scriptural reference now, so I listen to the Bible over. And do you know how long it takes to listen to the Bible, even on CD? And I listen to it over and over and over again. And then uh, I went through the Old Testament and I said, ah, I'm going to go to the epistles. And I listened to them over and over and over again. And uh, sometimes I haven't been able to do so in a while in terms of constantly inculcating myself with uh, certain verses. But I remember quite a bit. But you do begin to forget in terms of... Uh, time and place, you know, Acts 2.22, I just remember, this is what the Bible said. And I forget the Acts 2.22 or the other things. But 
That's not, that's, not, that's not the issue. What I'm trying to get across to you is the fact that you don't... It's not the man. It's the message. And far too many believers right now have their eyes on the man. And they're looking for a man who... Well, a lot of women look for a man who's handsome. But not only handsome, but a man who can talk very nicely about the spiritual life. And a man who can say, the Lord will bless you. Are you down today? Are you depressed? Why are you depressed? The Lord can help you. The Lord's at your right hand. The Lord is your helper. Then he'll say, the Lord will make all things work together for good. And that's it. Period. Forget that other part, please. Just that part. The Lord will make everything work out. Everything's going to be all right. Are you poor? Keep listening to me. You'll be rich. Oh, and on top of that, just how about some tithing? Give me some money so God can make you rich. Does any of that make sense? Well, a lot of people follow that. Makes no sense to me. And people say, I'm giving money to God, 10%. Who are you? God needs money. God needs your worthless dollars. When I say worthless, I mean it. Literally. That's a double entendre. God needs your dollars. The very God that is making those dollars worthless because you failed in your spiritual life. Where's your thinking? It's not there. It's arrogance. It's pride. And that is where we move into the interlocking systems of arrogance where believers live and they will not recover because they have no humility and they'll never admit to God when they're wrong. They've got to be right no matter what. They've got to cause drama no matter what. Have you met those people? I have. Seems like that's all I ever run into. Drama people. And they're all around as a testing and you've met them too. Just a big test. Drama, drama, drama. You know, if I want drama, I'll turn on Jerry Springer and get a laugh out of it. I don't have to have it in my own life. If I want drama, I'll watch a show. Get a kick out of it. But uh, once you grow spiritually, if some drama comes into your life, uh, you may get a kick out of it yourself unless it hits really, really, really close to home. And then when that happens, it's called testing. If you're in fellowship. If you're out of fellowship... It's called, you're being punished, dummy. You know you weren't supposed to do that. You can't get away with anything, you fool. Oh, sure, you listen to doctrine. But be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. And that has to do with the fact that uh, you hurt yourself. You didn't follow the rules for your own benefit, so there is no benefit. Only punishment. I have the stripes on my back to prove it. Not literally. I said that once and somebody wrote, I forgot who it was. I wouldn't tell you if I knew who it was. But they wrote me and they said, do you really have stripes on your back where God punished you? And I said, it, it was a saying. No, I don't have any stripes on my back where I had been whipped or I had been in a car accident or anything like that. I was nice. Although I was laughing to myself, and I said, no. I was uh, just talking in terms of the fact that I've been skinned alive with a whip, and God, does, it got, God hits you right where it hurts, when, when you need to be hit right where it hurts. Whatever, wherever. You see, sometimes you might love something so much. You do anything for that one thing that you love. It becomes like uh, that thing Smeagol was after in that movie. The rain, and he would call it precious. My precious, my precious. That's how a lot of politicians are with power. Come here, my precious, my precious power. And uh, a lot of people get focused on one thing, their little precious. And they go after it, and they go after it. And, and then they may even have their little precious for a little while. But they've lost their first love. So guess what? Their little precious dies. Their little precious dies and goes to hell. Or 
Something else occurs. Everything that they thought was important it disappears within a few years' time. Everything changes just like that. And why? Because you failed in your spiritual life. And God is punishing you to wake you up. And He's hitting you right where it hurts. But you're so hard-headed, you don't come around. And the longer you don't come around, the more scar tissue builds, the more you get involved into the interlocking systems of arrogance, and boom, you die eventually. The sin face to face with death, and I don't care if you're 84. You just lived uh, from the time of your salvation, let's say it was 20, you just lived 64 years of misery. And then you die. And by God's grace, of course, absent from the body and face to face with the Lord, in a place of no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. The old things have passed away, but we're not done yet. We have the, the Bema, which is the evaluation throne. And they, you're going to be shocked there. You're going to be really shocked at the Bema. And it's kind of funny. I'm a short fellow. And I don't have a complex about it. I may have used to. I don't know. But uh, probably not. I really never thought about it. Short being odd, just short. But then, as I grew older, I said, "Wow, but there is a, there is really something about it. People, people really, uh, tall is what gets you somewhere. You seen a short president? There have been a few, but you, in these modern days, you have not seen a short president. Not one. George Bush, tall." Barack Obama, tall. George H.W. Bush, tall. I mean, compared to normal standards, taller than average. Ronald Reagan, tall, handsome. Jimmy Carter, I don't know, he's just ugly. Oh well. But you see, the point is, there is this thing about being short. And I am short. And so... That could become some type of hang-up or some type of, well, I'm going to have an inferiority complex because I'm short. You know who else was short? The Apostle Paul. And that was not a hang-up for him. Peter was large. That kind of was a hang-up for Peter. Because he thought, everyone thought because Peter was so tall and big and large that he had a natural leadership. And God did definitely have a purpose for him, and he did finally get straightened out in his old age, and he did finally make it to play Roma. But when he was younger, just he just thought he was he was it. He had a superiority complex. While those who those men who may be short, they may have an inferiority complex. Once you get past that door of hope into confidence and sharing the confidence of God, it doesn't matter to you how you look or how anyone else looks. That's not even an issue anymore. But anyway, we get to Matthew 19, 16 through 28, and it begins to talk about flaws. It begins to talk about hang-ups. And what it really begins to talk about is that which keeps you from Bible doctrine. Now, in the sense of what Peter was teaching to the unbelievers, they rejected it because of pride. In the sense of believers, they reject doctrine because of pride. The very same pride. Now, you can turn to Matthew 19, 16 through 28 and read over it for yourself. It is talking about a hang-up. It's talking about arrogance. It's talking about a syndrome, a legalistic syndrome. But I'm not going to go over that specifically in terms of reading it to you. Now, you can all have some kind of syndrome uh, depending on your area of weakness. There are some people who are kleptomaniacs. That's their area of weakness. That is not my area of weakness. In fact, that's my area of strength. When I see a thief, I don't like it. When I hear of people talk about the redistribution of wealth and taking from the rich and giving to the poor, legalization of theft, I become righteously indignant, maybe even self-righteous. No, it's wrong. You don't take other people's hard-earned money. 
evil. But then uh, some other area, I may have an area of weakness and somebody joins right in with me and guess what? Oh, we're cool, we're just fine. Nothing wrong with us. We're just doing what everybody else does. And that's part of the old sin nature and self-deception. Well, let's see. God the Holy Spirit hits Peter and he's filled with God the Holy Spirit. He does not receive the gift of tongues, but he receives the gift of the interpretation of tongues and that's because he needs to take some time to give the gospel in a very matter-of-fact way to religious people. And that is the only way you can ever give the gospel to the religious. It is in a matter-of-fact, bold, and this is the way it is type deal. And you have to do it bold. And you may even have to throw in some things that they would consider an insult, but it's true. Because these religious people have been walking around their whole lives thinking they're perfect or nearly perfect and that God loves them and God despises them. And they're on the road to hell. Now, when I say God despises them, I'm talking in terms of an anthropopathism. God doesn't despise anyone. He can't. But he's in opposition to their arrogance and their pride because it's the same pride Satan had. And so in Acts 2.22, Peter says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Now, what he really says, and, I'm, and now he's raising his voice. He's in a large crowd. And there's a lot of uh, people speaking in tongues to other Jews who had immigrated, uh, into the, who were, went on a pilgrimage into the area for the uh, holy day of Pentecost. And so there were... 120 people out there with the gift of tongues uh, speaking to all these different 120 languages. So it sounded like a large commotion. It sounded like... Have you ever uh, sat around in a uh, large crowd and just listened and what do you hear? And it just sounds like confusion. A whole bunch of people talking. Well, that's the way it was. And they were in the middle of a big city and people are talking. So Peter had to raise his voice. And Peter was up close and personal with the relig religious leaders. In fact, some of the religious leaders had a bit of respect for Peter because Peter knew the law. By this time, he had learned how to read. By this time, he had learned how to write. And by this time, he was memorizing the Torah and so some of the religious leaders began to have a bit of respect for Peter. And then Peter stared at them, looked them in the eye, and told them who they were. It's the only way to deal with religious types when giving the gospel. Because they come in thinking, I am healed, I don't need a doctor. But you've got to get them walking away thinking, I am ill, I need a doctor, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Peter makes sure he gets the message across. So he says, and I'm going to say it the way he would say it, because there's a large crowd all around. He has got to raise his voice, and he's got to raise it so loud that, it's, that he's shouting. And a lot of people don't like shouting. They say it sounds like you're mad or something. It's not that Peter was mad. He had to shout to get above everything. And the Bible even says he was shouting. And this is what he said. Fellow Israelites, concentrate. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God. By miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through Him, as you yourselves know. Now this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And they understood that. They were the scholars of the day, and they were shocked to hear Peter talking in terms of theology. And you... He's looking at these people. He's staring them in the eye. They're not that far away, but it's so loud he's got to scream. And he looks at them and he says, And you!
with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Ooh, that hurt. Did it not? Nailed the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross and he said, you did it. It shook them up. They had never been talked to that way in their whole life. Uh, they're, they're the Pharisees. You know how they were talked to? Just like I heard a con- I had to hear uh, something the other day on the telephone. Uh, Father Monsoir. Oh, Father. You know, it was a Catholic helping another Catholic, an older Catholic priest, I guess, uh, with uh, something. But I was on the phone having to listen, listen to it and aid this person at, at work concerning their account. You, do you think I called him Father? No. But... Uh, she would say, well, Father, uh, do you need to speak to Father so-and-so? He is the owner on the account. Do you need to speak with him? And she was tr- talking sweet, as you know, like a woman. Oh, okay. Let me get you to Father Monsoon or whatever. And uh, I will let you speak with him, talking in hushed tones. And then he answered the phone. This is Father so-and-so. And I said, hello, Mr. So-and-so. I need to verify your account, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to call you a father. Not my father. You're nobody. You're a self-righteous rag. And if you want to know what I really think, Isaiah 64, 6. A self-righteous minstrel rag, father so-and-so. And that's about what Peter did to these religious people. He about looked them in the eye and said, Hey! You're all self-righteous minstrel rags. And it shocked them. They had never been talked to that way before. And if I had talked to Father Monserrat in such a way, I would be fired. Nobody ever talked to Father Monserrat that way. After all, he's Father Monserrat. How did he become Father Monserrat? I don't know. He was promoted through Satan's system. And so, this is the first time they've ever been yelled at by anyone. In fact, all the Jews would run to them any time they had a question concerning the law. What should I do? What should I do, Father? It is, it is, uh, it is now the Sabbath. It's Saturday. My sheep is lost. What should I do? And then the rabbi would probably give some bad advice. If the sheep is to come back, Since it is the Sabbath, the Lord shall bring your sheep back. If not, you've just lost your sheep. But you know, a good way to get around that, uh, for the Jews to get around that would be to say, so that's the law, Father? Yes. What if I get the sheep back and give you 10% of the profit I make on it? Then you are doing the Lord's will, and now go get the sheep. (laughs) That's how they were. Just like the Baptist of today. Whom I despise with a, with a righteousness, not self-righteousness, righteous indignation. Because they're not even given the gospel anymore. And the Bible belt is no longer the Bible belt. It's the religious belt. And we're getting whipped by it. The pivot's going to move from the south to somewhere else. Hopefully, Ohio. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe London, we just don't know. But there's always a pivot somewhere, at least a little bit of one. And uh, maybe more people will turn around as I keep uh, teaching as much as I can. And I know, I put on my website daily and you go there and you say, it's not there yet, it's not there yet. I'm busy, very, very, very busy. And I'm doing as much as I can and I'm still doing more than most. And I plan on to continue doing more and more until I actually do get in line with that schedule. And I'm doing that because I'm, I'm getting some uh, my administrator to help me. To help me in terms of... Because you, when I come home from work at 10.30, starting to go on 11, you got to wind down a little, and then you give a message, and then it's 12.30. Then you have to load the thing, and it takes... Maybe an hour. Depends on what mood it's in. Maybe all night. Who knows? So I'm sitting there uploading this because I know it's my duty and I know there are uh, 200 people waiting anxiously 
to listen. Uh, some of you may pick up on facetiousness, but yeah, but there are. Uh, it has increased a lot. And there are people anxiously awaiting the next message. And I, I apologize. I, I sit at the computer and I'm waiting for that thing to upload. And the next thing I know, I have to wake up. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there and then I wake up and say, oh, time to go to work and go get in the shower and take off. Well, now that I have an administrator that, can, that I'm teaching that can do that part of it, then that leaves more time for me for studying and teaching. And now that I have someone who will be able to do the evangelistic type things of making DVDs or even maybe printing out a pamphlet of some sort, who knows, whatever I want done, that takes that burden off me. I've already got the information and I've already... Done. The, I have already done my part, and that's why you need an administration. That's what God told Moses. God told Moses, you can't do everything, and that's true. Moses was trying to do everything. He was trying to be the great judge over two million recalcitrant believers. Not only that, he had to teach them daily the Word of God. Not only that, he had to take, uh, take control of the matters of state, the matters of military, the matters of following the law, the matter, just so much. It was unbelievable. And uh, the, so they, came up, they recognized it. Some people recognized this and they said, Moses, or God said, Moses, you've got to delegate. You've got to, you've got, yes, you're, you, you are a good and faithful servant, but you've got to delegate and focus on this one thing. And he did. Well, now, you say, I've listened now and I haven't heard one mechanic. <clears throat> you shouldn't be hearing a mechanic. You should be listening to a pastor teacher. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to get a laugh machine one day and just stick it here. And when I say something funny, I'm going to push it. I'm joking. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, we do have mechanics to go over. And what? why is it that Peter is having to shout to these religious people and call them out and call them a murderer and tell them that they themselves have murdered the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Peter sent them into shock, and in fact, some of them believed. Can you imagine? I've had to use that form of witnessing before. I've, I've done it a little more recently. And uh, holy cow, you would think that I had just uh, grown horns and turned into the devil. I was, I was excommunicated from everybody I, I, I knew. Because somebody said that they could work their way into heaven or that it was a mixture of work and faith. And I told them, you're going to hell unless you believe in Christ. And I gave the verses. And of course, Romans uh, 10, uh, 2, 8, or Romans 2, 8, 9 came up. Uh, Confess with your mouth and all that. And obviously, the person was already arguing with me before she had read what I had put previously because I covered that so quickly. Because I knew exactly what was coming. I covered James. I covered Romans 10, 9 and 10. Uh, I covered every verse that they pull out that they want to stick to and that says that they think contradicts with the hundreds of verses that tell one how to be saved. And I listed the hundreds of verses and I also listed those verses that were misinterpreted and she still said the same thing. So again, I said, unless you believe in Christ, you're going to hell. So I was excommunicated from whatever goofy place I was in. I don't remember. Drama, drama, drama. But I gave the gospel. And maybe that shook her up enough to believe. And in fact, I know now she believes faith alone in Christ alone And people think they know how to do something. Sometimes you have to. When it comes to the scar tissue of the soul and to religious people, it's the only way. 
I'll never forget the Easter message I did down in Anderson, South Carolina, in which I had a, a, a larger number of people on an Easter, of course, than usual. This man called a prophet walked in, and I knew right then, here comes trouble. He called himself a prophet, even had a card, had prophet on it. And I could feel my blood just starting to boil just a little bit, and then I would calm down. Then I began preaching. Well, first we had our song service. And you can immediately tell what's going on, because when you have a song service, you song and you sing and you uh, sing as unto the Lord, not as unto people. And these people were singing as unto people, closing their eyes, holding their hands heavenward, doing all of those things. I didn't call them out for that. I knew who they were. I've been around them all my life. Not my, not my parents, the relatives, the other relatives. The arrogance of it. And that made me start to seethe just a little bit. And then I calmed down. I was in fellowship. But it was Easter, so you know what I'm going to do on Easter. I'm going to give the gospel. And there were a lot of people in there who had not heard the gospel given the way I was about to give it. That's why the Lord sent that crazy man there. So I would give the gospel in a stern manner, in a way in which a lot of those had never heard it. And there were people who were probably saved who thought they were already saved because that all they ever did was invite Christ into their heart. And they finally heard the good news given forcefully. You can give good news forcefully. You know how? Here's an example. You win the lottery. And, and you say, first you're in shock. And you look at it and you say, I won the lottery. Then you look at the numbers and look at them again and look at them and say, I won the lottery. And then uh, you really study it out. And then you take it to your spouse or your friend or whomever and you say, I won the lottery. And they laugh. <laughs> no, you didn't. What do you do? I won the lottery. I won the lottery. Look yourself. Look at it. They got excited. And when you disagreed, they got all the more excited and yelled at you. Did you get angry? No, because you thought, ooh, I want a piece of that. Should the religious people get angry when somebody says, this is the good news, Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you, and all you have to do is believe in Him, and you'll be saved? But instead of getting excited, what happened was the man broke out in a rash that went all over his body. I'm serious. He was ugly to start with, and then he looked like he was coming down with leprosy. He couldn't take the gospel. And he looked at me, and he raised his hand, immediately wanted to ask a question about James, and I knew it, and I wasn't in the mood. And then I looked at him, and I said, You know what? It's awful funny how some people can fake how nice they are and all their brotherly love, but then I can give them the good news, and they glare at me with a hatred. Where does that come from? Oh, man, did I ever run over that guy? And he still wanted to argue after the message. He wasn't there for the second half, by the way. But I'll tell you something else, though. It was the first time a lot of those people there had ever heard the gospel given that way. And it may have been the first time they ever believed. It was a different way of giving it. I gave the gospel at my grandmother's funeral on my mother's side. Now, I didn't give it that way. It was totally different. I wasn't dealing with antagonistic people. It's at a funeral. And I was, you know, it was actually the first time I got up and really spoke in front of a number of people. I knew I had the gift. I knew I could do it. But at the same time, uh, you would almost cry the first time you try it to start with. And on the other hand, I just lost uh, someone I had known my whole life. So it's, it's sad. So I began to get choked up. But I was able to maintain my composure enough to give the gospel in a very beautiful and sweet way. And there was great response. And it, it just depends on the situation. How do you give it? And this is for those of you who are evangelists even. And especially for those of you who are pastors who may give... Uh, 
a sermon at the end, you've noticed that there's some rebellious people there and you know exactly how you should give the good news. A different style, the same message. A different style, but the exact same message. I said in a sweet way at the funeral, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then I said to the recalcitrant, rebellious, psychotic man who thought he was a prophet, you only believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Same, same message. Same words. It's the message. It's not the man. But with the gift of pastor teacher, oftentimes he knows exactly which way he must go to get through. And Peter knows at this time, for the first time ever, usually Peter was ready to compromise, 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 just like a politician. But when the Holy Spirit got hold of him, he was done compromising. And you have to understand he was talking to scribes, Pharisees and hypocrites, the leaders of of Israel under the fourth cycle. The leaders, leaders who could have him killed, beheaded, thrown in jail, which happened, not the beheading part, but he was thrown in jail and eventually he was hung, at least according to uh, some documents of history, and the Catholic Church believes it. And in the past, during that time, the Catholic Church had some doctrinal principles that they've gone way off now. And they, at that time, wrote that Peter was hung upside down on a cross. And that's how he died. So, you don't compromise. Even if somebody's going to hang you upside down on a cross, you do not compromise the gospel. You can't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's why you have eternal life. Now, what we have in this hang-up deal? This is what all the Pharisees had, a big hang-up. But now I'm going to bring it into Christianity. Because we, we're believers and I don't really want to discuss the unbeliever at this moment. But every one of us, at some point, has had a hang-up. Or we have a hang-up. Some sort of hang-up in life. And what I mean is, each and every one of us has an area of weakness. And that area of weakness can always pull you right into the interlocking systems of arrogance. Or the cog wheels of arrogance, which we've studied. Self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption. And last night, I know if you... You probably didn't get through the whole hour and 30 minutes. My mother told me that I sounded too tired. and Well, if I did, I know you probably hung up on me by the time you got there. But uh, go back and listen. I talked about a windmill that we went and uh, looked at in a place called Holland, Michigan. And uh, it had an interlocking system. And I described the wind as adversity. And it would turn those, what I call props large things which would turn the gear and then you could interlock a gear in order to pull up some grain and you could interlock another gear for it to do something else to grind the grain into flour it was just one massive engineering feat of interlocking system arrogance is the same that's why it, it's called the cosmic system it's a system just like that windmill was a system. Well, Satan has his system. And he has a way to suck you in to his plan. And that is the interlocking systems uh, or system of arrogance. Why? You have an old sin nature. And if you're sitting there saying, I don't sin, or at least I don't practice sin, or you're saying something of um, something of nonsense to where you've never you never name your sins to God. You're out of it. You are so far gone that you're in the interlocking systems of arrogance system of arrogance, and uh, you can't be distinguished from an unbeliever. But as a believer, you can be pulled into this because we have an old sin nature. We have hang-ups. 
Now, we're all different. This is where we get the drama. We're all different in our old sin natures. There you have areas of strength and you have area of weakness. In some people's area of strength uh, deals with uh, the fact that they're extremely moral and would never do anything immoral or think they wouldn't. And so they really and they really uh, develop some pride about that because they look around and they see men and women going to bars, hooking up your place or mine, etc. And they stick their nose up in the air and they say, Oh, Father, I'm so glad I'm not like them. Not knowing that maybe they're worse. They're covered in... This is what the Bible says about them. And uh, if you have children listening, cover their ears. I'll give you five seconds, like Rush Limbaugh gives five seconds on his radio show to get the children out of the room when something, when a point needs to be made. Five, four, three, two, one. You can be committing the sins of self-righteousness and you are blind and the Bible says that you are covered in shit and you can't even smell yourself. And that is the literal word used. Isn't, isn't that a way to put something? Now a legalist would flip out. What did you just say? I just quoted scripture, that's all. And that's how I think of these legalists. Covered in dung, but they can't smell themselves. Okay, the children can come back now if they're listening at all. Or they could go send them out to play or something. Now my parents, they would sit me down at some point in my life. I had to listen to 30 minutes and that helped in terms of concentration. And you may want to do that too with your children. But an hour for a child, way too much. But I did pick up on things for 30 minutes. And I don't know, maybe even sometimes I sat through the whole thing, just sitting there watching those little bobbers on those old machines go up and down, up and down. And I probably fell asleep watching that or went into some type of trance. That's how I got into that cult, you see. <laughs> I need a laugh machine. I really do. <laughs> Nobody can hear and the thousands of people down there laughing because the way I have this microphone set up. <laughs> See, I definitely need a laugh machine. Nobody will get it. All right, the hang up. Now that's going into the cosmic system. That is going into the interlocking systems of arrogance. And before I close, I'll just go over the interlocking systems of arrogance and I... I can't put it up on the web because this was written by Colonel R.B. Thing, The Interlocking Systems of Arrogance, and it's not mine. And I've asked, or my administrator asked, Baraka, if I could post these things, and they said no. Because it is his. But they say he can reference them so long as he gives credit where credit is due, and I'm always thankful to do that. The greatest pastor since Paul came up with these, the interlocking systems of arrogant system of arrogance due to uh, for believers. Now I know Peter's talking to unbelievers, but we need application for ourselves. So this is definitely by Colonel R.B. Theme Jr. And uh, he created the, the it's called cosmic the cosmic system. What's that? Uh, that's where everybody runs around and says you're worldly. And they think that being worldly is for the ladies you put on makeup, for the men you, I don't know, you look at women. I, I, I seem to have an idea that there's a lot of legalistic women who want men to be like a, a Richard Simmons type guy. And uh, a man's a man. A woman's a woman. And uh, uh, Richard Simmons is uh, Richard Simmons. <laughs> never met anyone like a Richard Simmons, and I hope I never will. <laughs> and I only say that because when I was younger, my mother watched that guy talking to these huge women, and he would be crying along with them, and I would just, <laughs> even when I was younger, I just could not handle it. 
<laughs> this is gross. Please, Lord, make it stop. <laughs> Where's Scooby Dooby Doo? <laughs> or SpongeBob slum pants or something. That's what my dad said the other day. Because the I have a two year old son and he's never heard of SpongeBob SquarePants, so he said, Hey Lou, look, scumbob slum pants or something. Scumbag. Scumbag square pants. <laughs> Well, here are the interlocking systems, and we'll go from gate 1 to gate 11, and this has to do with the cosmic system, and I'm simply going to name them now. You don't have to even write notes on it, because in the second message, uh, this is where we'll be heading into the mechanical area of it. But it will be taught by a pastor and not a mechanic, but we will be in the mechanical area, finally, so that you can put it down and memorize 11 gates. All right, first of all, what takes you into the cosmic system? Number one, gate one, motivational arrogance. You're motivated. We're all motivated by something. If you're not motivated, you're dead. That is, your phys if your physical body is not motivated in some way, to think in some way or whatnot, you're either dead or near death or in a coma. So all of the interlocking system of arrogance begins with his thought which uh, the motivational air the motivational arrogance is what some sort of pride jealousy some type of mental attitude sin now that's the motivation and that's why under the uh, if you go to the illustrations that I've done that I can post you will see that there are people who have a love for the cosmic system and they are motivated to live within it. And they love it. They love the drama. They can't live without the drama. And if suddenly there's no drama, they've got to make some drama. And if the person they're trying to make drama with doesn't allow drama, they've got to go even harder at it. And then they'll find somebody to talk to who will agree with them. And then they'll have their own little drama fest. And if you're the subject of the drama and you have just left everything in the Lord's hands, you are in for a tremendous blessing and the other person is in for triple compound discipline. And if they're talking against a pastor, they are under sextuplet compound discipline, which is why so many people drop dead out of the blue. I know many stories of that. I won't give it right now and not with me. I don't know anyone around me who has gossiped about me and, and fallen over dead. If it did happen, I wouldn't let you know about it, but I would know about it. But I do know I've been blessed while others have been sorely cursed because of their tongue. So that's gate one, motivational arrogance. Gate two, which we will study, negative volition. You know, once you have a motivation to move into the mental attitude sins, then comes the negative volition. You're not going to listen to doctrine. You have a right to be angry. You have a right to be upset. You have a right to be offended, even though there was nothing to be offended about. In fact, you walk around looking to be offended. That's what's wrong with the United States in many ways. People walking around looking to be offended. Now, Herman Cain, a man running for president, and apparently... Uh, as far as the Republican field is concerned, apparently the at, at the moment the uh, what they call the the front runner, which is garbage. There, there's never a front runner until votes are pa are are given. And beforehand, the fourth estate tries to pick who they like, and they look around. And they say, and they always go on the superficial, and they do want to be right. They have a credibility. Fox News wants to be right. They have a credibility to uphold. The others have no credibility. They don't care anymore. But Fox News has credibility, and they want to be right. So how do they do it? They look at the superficial, and they all get together, and they say, well, look at Mitt Romney. Isn't he handsome? Yeah, he's handsome. Look at his hair. I wish I had hair like Mitt Romney, and they may think to themselves. Listen to how he talks. He's pretty smooth. People will vote for that, won't they? Yeah, they will. Well, he's got to be the front runner. Sure, yeah, he must be. And look at this guy from Texas, Rick Perry. Well, he's from Texas. He's got some swagger. You see the way he walks? You see the way he talks? You see, people might be looking for that now. They're, they're, they're tired of this mishmush. 
They want somebody, in other words, what they're saying is they want George W. Bush back. They would never admit it to you. But they want, he sounds like George W. Bush. He walks like George W. Bush. He's tall like George W. Bush. He's a Texan. And in Texas, you have giants and you have midgets. And the only way I could ever feel better about being short would be to go to an H-E-B in Austin, Texas. And if you don't get the joke, you're not supposed to. If you're in Texas, you get the joke. And then gate three, authority, arrogance. Gate four, and that's a big one. We're going to get over all, we're going to go over all this. Gate four, self-righteous arrogance. Gate five, sexual arrogance. Something David had a problem with. Gate six, criminal arrogance. Something David had a problem with. A man after God's own heart. Gate seven, psychotic arrogance, including grandiosity. Something that a lot of believers have. I wish I could name names. Then you have gate eight, the arrogance of unhappiness, self-pity. People who mope around all day because they don't get the attention they want, etc., etc., or they're bored, or they don't know what to do with themselves, and they feel sorry for themselves, even though they still live, even though we're in a kind of a funk in, economically, they live in the greatest country in the world with the greatest freedom in the world, with the greatest of all things in the world, with uh, uh, TVs that are large, and they can go out uh, with their tax uh, money, tax return, and they can buy a big screen TV, or even a big screen 3D TV, or if they feel bad, some Someday they can go shopping and pick out their favorite game and they can sublimate all over the place and guess what? They still feel sorry for themselves. And sometimes, some people, after they go on a big splurge and spend all that money, they come home with all these things and they start playing it and then they feel guilty and say, Man, I sure did spend all my money. Why'd I spend all my money? Where's me monies? You spend it all and then they feel guilty about that. So you see, some people just aren't going to be happy. And if you are in the cosmic system, I guarantee you will not be happy. You'll be worried and thinking about everything. And anything you do, you'll feel good. And th these type people who go into self-pity, they will switch rapidly from self-pity to self-righteousness. Self-pity, I feel so guilty. I should have never done that. I wish I would have done that differently. Over to self-righteousness. You shouldn't do it that way. You should do it the way I do it. And then back to self-pity. Oh, me, man. Oh, things are awful. And then right back to sitting back and forth. That's called polarized fragmentation. So we have psychotic, and that often leads to psycho psychosis. And then gate eight, the arrogance of unhappiness, self-pity. Gate nine, iconoclastic arrogance, a big problem. Big problem in this nation. Big problem among believers. Men and women, but especially women as a responder. Iconoclastic arrogance. And, uh, for example, during the courting time, the woman turned you into an idol. And she talks to her girlfriends and say, This man, he opens the car door for me. He's such a gentleman. He is so witty and funny. He buys me the best dinners. He's so funny and we just have such a great time together and she builds him up into a god, an idol. Then they say, I do. And then they go home and uh, they look over at their idol and they see something wrong with him for the first time. And then they say, you, out of nowhere they start acting funny. And then they may say, what's wrong with you? You're so quiet. Nah, nothing wrong with me. What's wrong with you? I'm fine. Oh, well, why don't you say anything? Well, I think you're disgusting. And there you go. Iconoclastic arrogance. They begin to bash the idol they created. And why? Well, he did something that she didn't like. What, what did she want to do? She wanted to marry herself, whom she loves very much. That's it. She wanted a clone of herself. And vice versa. You ladies don't get all... Don't get your panties in a wad. And you men, you could be the same way. Oh, this woman's beautiful. That only goes so far, by the way. 
Well, this woman is, uh, wow, she's so submissive. Yeah, during the courting process, sure. Then you get her into marriage and you find out she has a feet of clay. Maybe she's not as smart as you thought she was. Maybe uh, she goes out and spends all your money and doesn't even think about it. And now you want to destroy her. But I thought she was so great to start with. And there goes marriage, right? The Christian marriage right out the door. Why? Iconoclastic arrogance, the cosmic system. Then you go, then you have intellectual or emotional arrogance. Emotional arrogance, holy rollers, self-explanatory. Intellectual arrogance, people who think they're smarter than they really are. Well, I've known a lot of those. O oftentimes they have itching ears. And oftentimes they try to instruct me. That's intellectual arrogance. And you say, why? Because they're trying to instruct you? Yes, it is. <laughs> Does that mean you have it because you know everything? No, I just know everything. Got it? Good. That's a joke too. Now I'll be quoted like that. I don't know everything. I just know more than you. I know more than you. <laughs> See, that makes people mad too. And if you're as offended by that, well, you should be proud that your pastor knows more than you, shouldn't you? Because if he doesn't, you're going backwards, you reversionist. Uh-oh, you just had an attitude change, didn't you? You went from, ooh, he sounds awful arrogance, to, ooh, I'm going backwards. Don't mess with the Holy Spirit. And then you move on to gate 11, the arrogance of Christian activism. And boy, are we ever seeing that, and will you ever see it in this election cycle? Now, that doesn't mean you can't talk about politics around the kitchen table and you can't talk about the certain candidate that you like and you can't have discussions about it, but it does mean that you better not be so distracted that you think that that one man is going to turn the world upside down because I can tell you something. We could elect the greatest president. We could elect the greatest president we've ever had. We could elect a president greater than Ronald Reagan, but if the pivot's gone, it's over and the greatest president we've ever had would be blamed for it. Jesus Christ controls history. Keep that in mind. That doesn't mean you can't vote. That doesn't mean you can't support a certain candidate who has integrity, who understands capitalism, who understands the rule of law. Of course you support uh, such a person. And uh, of course you support a candidate who loves Israel. Of course. I know one candidate who is unabashedly Unashamed, unashamed to talk about Israel and how they, they are our greatest ally in the world. And how if Israel's attacked, it's an attack on the United States of America. And I respond to that because I know the doctrine behind why there is so much anti-Semitism. So I respond to things uh, like that. And I say, yeah, that's a good guy to vote for right there. Join the cane train. But see, I'm not promoting him. You join whatever you want. I'm just telling you, right now anyway, I might change my mind later. Who knows? Matayotes. Change my mind. But right now, I think I want to join the, the cane train. Well, we will uh, get into the fact of cosmic testing. You are tested. Even Satan, even by Satan, there is a, a Satan's interlocking system of arrogance. You're tested to get involved in it and to where you'll never recover. And we will study these things. And there are people being tested. There are people who go extremely hot for the word and then suddenly they're off in the la-la land because they've been tested. Thought testing. That's part of thought testing. Or system testing. They just got done wrong at work. Or, uh, disaster testing. You've lost a son, a daughter, a family member. Or you've lost, uh, within a very short time, father, grandmother, grandfather, uh, sister, brother, what, what not. 
Well, this life is a veil of tears. That's why you need to learn this doctrine so you can handle it on the one hand and on the other hand so you can enjoy it. This life's enjoyable. It does have its tears. But joy will come in the morning. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us to what we have studied. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.